Uh, yeah, I could probably start with an uh, example of uh, a recent sales order that I completed uh, and uh, some trends we're seeing with some of the smaller companies that uh, we support. Uh, we're seeing suddenly, obviously, less resilience in moving to cloud services such as uh, Office 365 Teams, uh, OneDrive, SharePoint, uh, etc. Uh, beforehand, sometimes telling a client uh, that the advantages of these uh, these solutions uh, kind of fed on deaf ears, but now uh, has been quite a U-turn from people where they've been put in a situation like this, and now they're suddenly understanding that it is a good way to go. So one example of this was a client who. Uh, had an office space which they didn't own uh, and a, a server that they didn't own as well which they had like a partial access to in like a college environment it's quite a unique setup but uh, they recently went completely to a serverless solution where there was absolutely no reliance on any other IT team other than obviously ourselves as an IT support company and uh, Microsoft's uh, infrastructure so uh, they've gone from like a, a hosted uh, uh, RDS infrastructure, or be internal to uh, to Office 365 completely, with uh, all their data in SharePoint and OneDrive, all their office emails in uh, Exchange Online, and also uh, they're using Teams as a communication tool there. And uh, I, obviously, when I carry out such a sales order, uh, I usually use the weekend to my advantages, uh, so we can get all the data up to the cloud without it affecting their busy work times. And I always warn people that Monday morning is going to be a fun time for those. Uh, and to be honest with you, I think by 11 o'clock on Monday morning, I think 90% of the uh, troubleshooting and uh, familiarity uh, work was done. Uh, and then there's been two or three other calls, but uh, that sales order was kind of closed off with little to no uh, complications. Uh, they're probably working, uh, they feel that they're working better than ever. And funnily enough, they've got an office move to do after all this. And now they know that they can just pick up their laptops, go into the office and pretty much work as they are working from home, albeit in obviously a, a business environment. So uh, it's quite good to see how flexible that business has become with a very, very somewhat small uh, sales order. Uh, now they're looking into maybe making things a bit more secure. So looking to a multi-factor authentication in that environment. They also op opted for Office 365 backup. So uh, what quite a lot of people do is assume that Microsoft's, uh, so there's a lot of backup and uh, restoration capabilities within uh, Office 365 in terms of retention. But uh, we also do suggest that you have a, a different product backing up that data. Uh, so they opted to go for such a product so that if you read Microsoft's terms and conditions, and maybe John might be able to touch on this a bit more after this, but uh, they do put the data in the client's kind of uh, onus where you've got to take care of your data, even though it's in their, their cloud. So uh, we just have a, a, a backup service off that. So we have got a, a second line of defense should such a, maybe uh, someone exploit Office 365 or someone accidentally or on purposely delete some data. So uh, yeah, that's quite a good little success story recently. And it's just a, quite a repeatable way of setting up a lot of other companies of that size. Obviously the bigger the company, the longer the company has been established, there's more considerations to go into that. But for that company, there was very little uh, stopping them from working in such a way. I, I could just add, add to that as well that um, for a lot of businesses, if you're expanding the number of remote workers that are working, for instance, if you're doubling the number of uh, users that are accessing an RDS server, it's very important to also think about your sort of on-premise infrastructure. Um, so, for instance, you might need to look at things like memory, storage in servers, um, extra server licensing and certificates. So um, once you've gone past the initial point of rolling out remote working to more people you need to sort of think about those considerations but it's also very important too as well to sort of look at the security jamie mentioned um to mfa um that's obviously a very useful step but it's important to sort of just look at um the whole security around how your remote users access these systems because otherwise you know only would be hacker would have a sort of pandora's box into all your systems so it's very important to sort of look at that and that's the sort of secondary um phase that we're, we're seeing within our clients I don't know if maybe John, maybe you can sort of just speak a bit more about some of the uh, 
security um, sort of authentication aspects of, uh, that you can improve? Yeah, I mean, actually, what I was I was going to uh, just sort of throw the question out to the floor really and see um, how people are actually finding working from home. Obviously, with the with the pandemic, um, obviously Richard started off discussing at the be- beginning there that the various options and you know at ADM we've helped clients set up various different ways of working from home. There's the, the more traditional um, accessing your on-premise environment um, via RDS or VPN and stuff like that. Uh, and then there is also the the, the sort of new 365, um, you know, if you're working within Teams or SharePoint, um, uh, which, uh, you know, is, 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 is like the, effectively the modern way of working. Um, uh, obviously, what Matt was indicating there, there's, uh, there's all sorts of additional security features you can put on that to restrict where your, your data is. But, um, yeah, I mean, it, I was just sort of like throwing it open to the floor, really, to see how people are finding um, uh, working from home and which of those sort of technologies they're using and um, how, how they're finding it. I don't know if anybody, any of the clients here are, you know, prepared to sort of share their experiences and um the problems they might be facing. Silence. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, that's, um, it's one of the things, um, obviously, with, you know, the, the certain, certain um, users of um, certain clients have got sort of applications in their on premise environment, which they do require the RDS or VPN access to. Um, and other, other other companies are able to work totally using the cloud uh, functionality. So um, there, there there are two options um, on the on the cloud functionality. Um, uh, there are, there is the additional um, EMS um, licensing that you can have, which bring, brings extra um, security to it. So you can restrict where data, who downloads data, and what devices. Which maybe I can go into. Um, in a minute, but basically you can restrict uh, downloading a data to sort of company managed devices only, and the ability to um, to remove that data should the device be compromised in any way. Um, you can require multi-factor authentication uh, in certain locations and not other locations. So you, you can have trusted locations uh, in your office location where you, you aren't challenged for MFA. Uh, and if anyone's accessing outside of th- those premises, as as people are at the moment, they would be prompted for uh, the the additional uh, multi-factor authentication. Uh, we can also restrict which countries people can access from. Uh, there's, there's a whole sort of myriad of things that we can restrict and control there. Um, Thank you, John. We do have a uh, question come through from David. Uh, David, if you could unmute and feel free to ask. Yeah, thanks very much. I know you look after the uh, IT interests of many companies uh, throughout East Kent, and I'm not concerned for them, but there are other companies as well. And with EasyJet uh, losing data as well, I know it's a concern of a lot of small and medium companies' security of their data when they have so many workers working remotely and may just simply press the wrong button. Uh, There seems to be a movement the companies we've been dealing with towards Microsoft Teams, and you're doing some training for me, which I'm very grateful for. Uh, I'm sure uh, it's terrific. But a lot of people don't have that. Uh, is there any sort of simple message you can pass on to companies about when they're working remotely, some of the sort of more obvious problems they experience and so on that uh, you, you could uh, uh, tell us about? Uh, you must have come across a lot of these. Uh, prevention being better than cure. <laughs> yeah, is that specifically in terms of sort of data protection you're talking there? Isn't yes, it? Uh, since the GDPR stuff, of course, people are uh, yeah. huge fines. Is it up to 4% of your global turnover and so on? Yeah. And some of these, uh, we don't have many very large companies uh, in East Kent, but we have quite a few SMEs and, uh, and so on. And uh, it is a concern. And uh, you mentioned about having separate storage in addition to everything else. And if people put things on the cloud, of course, you don't know who's going to finally get hold of it. So uh, I wonder if there's a message that we could pass on from you to companies, uh, something along those lines. Yeah, absolutely. So the um, I suppose the key to uh, keep keeping track of your data is um, 
you know, is ultimately not to not to release it out into the wild in the first place. Now, of course, with the um, you know the enforced working from home that we've had with obviously the the current pandemic, um, I think there will be a reasonable number of businesses that have focused so much on. You know, well, this person can't do their job unless they have that data. So give, 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 you know, and, and sort of rolling out the technology we're talking about to give them the productivity. Um, but perhaps haven't initially thought about controlling that data and securing that data. So um, we have spoken before about having, I mean, typically your company data is centrally stored. And that's to say it's in a repository, which is either on your file server on a cloud server uh, within SharePoint or, or one of those um, sort of storage repositories. Um, and really the key to securing that is, is having such policies that it's not allowed to, to go and reside on other people's machines. So by that, um, I mean, for example, I think John mentioned it briefly earlier. Um, we can set policy um, in some of the tools we have in, in Microsoft EMS, um, which would dictate that that company data could be uh, it could be accessed, of course, but couldn't be uh, downloaded and stored down on those home machines. So if you've got people that may be working on home machines rather than company laptops, for example, um, we can dictate that that data. Uh, it can be viewed and edited, but it can't be um, pulled down and stored locally. So uh, that's that's one of the, the tools that we have. Um, and there are some advanced kind of rights management tools as well within that. So whereas previously it was uh, a very big challenge because if you put that data on a pen drive and you lose the pen drive, of course, that's, that's in, in the wild. Um, but we can now secure that at file level so that actually when you open that file um so just uh, to speak about perhaps what we have we have some options so if i'm in a word document uh i can go and say this is an internal internal only document and when people open that they'll be asked to log in so they'll be checked that they are an adm employee by way of their microsoft login um, and then they'll be able to access it. So if we lose those files on, on a pen drive, um, no one can actually access those anyway. And therefore, from a GDPR viewpoint, there's no actual usable data breach. Um, so I think in terms of what message can you, can you put out to businesses, um, I think it's probably my advice would be, and appreciate this is, is potentially too late in a number of cases but uh, you really need to be thinking about secure how you're going to secure the data before you go and release the data if, if that makes sense so it's you know the same thing uh, before you go and give people a mobile phone with with emails and company data on it the, the first project isn't giving them the phone and enabling the use the first project is how we secure that um, and then secondarily, how we give them access. Um, and I think, as I say, even though there may be issues where that's already happened, I think that's good advice, you know, is to think about security first and access second. And if you do that, then you'll always be ahead of, you know, letting these things out there, basically. Yeah, adding on to that, Richard, as well, uh, just a brief point is, uh, unless you've taken that approach that you've just recommended there, uh, I do get very nervous about, people saying well can I use my home PC to do my work on uh, establish a VPN connection or sync their OneDrive data to etc because you haven't got any control over that device you do not own that device uh, if that staff member leaves uh, the company uh, potentially there could be data if you haven't invested that time and effort into securing that data beforehand that data could remain well almost certainly will remain on that device and then you're entrusting that ex-staff member with potentially contact information, uh, contract details, etc. So uh, quite something that we nipped in the bud with a lot of our clients who hadn't really invested into the, let's say, SharePoint environment or uh, were working in a way where they wanted to use, say, OneDrive on their personal device uh, was to recommend that they use a company asset, which we had an element of control over. 
And obviously, once you start talking about that, you start talking about having that device encrypted as well. So if it came into the wrong hands, uh, no one would be able to get the data off of there uh, unless they broke bit lockers uh, algorithms, which is not and impossible. So uh, yeah, that's just a little add on to what you were saying there. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Thanks very much for that. Uh, it's the old rule, isn't it? Predict and prevent is better than find and fix. But simple message there, check security before you pass on the data. That, that's an excellent way of putting it. And it, would you say it's worthwhile somebody having a separate laptop, you know, for the sake of three or four hundred pounds, whatever it is, uh, yes. just have one with the, with that. Otherwise, people are going to have family photos and all sorts of personal things on, on their laptop, which a clever person is that something you would advise yeah absolutely i think if you you know if you keep your data within your corporate network and that's to say it's company owned devices uh then you've limited your risk because of course that you're going to get that back any um you know any hr issue or grievance or uh you know if that person ceases to be employed that's a company asset with the company data and that comes back to you. Um, you know, quite the opposite with a home machine. Uh, and frankly, unless you've got a particularly stringent um, policy that's been, you know, signed into by the employee, I'm not aware you've got really any rights to go and start insisting that you audit their home equipment and, and things like that, you know. So absolutely, if um, for the sake of a uh, a small investment for a company asset and then you've kept the data within your own remit yeah absolutely well that's great thanks very very much you've got an active guy warren dunham i think who wanders around talking to companies i'm sure he'll have that we'll certainly pass it on it it's always pays to talk to a professional in these matters thanks very much indeed thanks for your question david thank you david i hope that answers your question um we do have a bit of a success story as well from tom uh tom i'll let you unmute Hello. Hi, Tom. Hello. Um, yeah, mine was simply around uh, Synology access. Uh, we use Synology as our NAS within our network, our network accessible storage. Um, usually that's only LAN accessible within our offices. Uh, I think 99% of stuff was done within the office opposed to remotely until everything recent happened. Um, so previously it was simply done as a file share. Um, Disk Station Manager, their web access portal was used by higher management or IT um, solely to assign resources to the users. But when the users access their files, it would simply be done through file share. When we moved to remote working, we'd simply use a VPN and then those file shares would continue to act correctly, um, with the exception of a couple of the older access rights that were set up on work group rather than IP. But that was mostly OK. Um, aside from one user who couldn't access the VPN, so obviously they then couldn't use the file share. So the way we got around that is um, the disk station manager has the ability to restrict access to a user. So you can choose one of your users on disk station manager and say, I want them to be able to log in to disk station manager as well, but I don't want them to be able to see anything other than this. So we restricted her so that she could access the file manager through Disk Station Manager, but she couldn't access the settings or any of the controls. Um, this still wouldn't work out of the box because you have to be on the LAN, but um, there's a feature called Quick Connect that Synology offer uh, where they can give you a URL so you can directly access it on the web. Um, the only issue there is that then opened up an extra um, an extra access point within our network, if you like. So we got around that by enabling the two-factor authentication option that Synology offers as well. Yeah. Um, there were a couple of drawbacks on there. Um, like when you enable Quick Connect by default, it just allows you for everyone. You can't restrict that to just one or certain users. So it would be nice to have those features in the future. Um, but it was it was a good quick workaround to get them back to file sharing uh, using the DSM. There was a slight learning curve there. Uh, we had to install um, an authenticator app on their phone. We had to introduce them to two-factor, um, but, but it was about 20 minutes worth of training compared to telling them you can't access it until we get you back on the VPN. So it was quite a good workaround in the end. Yeah, that does sound good. And it's a good example, actually, of um, I think what we've seen, you know, there's a, 
that's not an idealistic solution. You know, it's mm. not something you'd have you'd have drawn on a blank sheet of paper. Um, but certainly in the current climate, you know, if it works, then that's great, isn't it? And you, you've got that user up and running. Um, and I think we've seen a you know quite a lot of that in the past few weeks. Um, you know, things don't have to be necessarily at this time 100% perfect. You know, it's not necessarily a a long term solution always but uh if you can get someone working then that's that's kind of the name of the game isn't it really yeah so i've long since given up troubleshooting uh since we've been in this home working environment i've come under fire from uh from all of my colleagues for my internet connection um which i shan't i shan't name and shame the provider but fair to say it's not uh, it's not great for video calls um and you know, after scratching heads on it for a while, is it the wireless problem or is it the uh, the connection? You know, I found that actually, I just use my iPhone for these sessions. That works really well, so you know that doesn't seem to cause an issue. So it's again an excellent workaround. Mm. Uh, probably not a long term solution, but uh, absolutely works works for today. So yeah, well, we've disabled that now that we've got them back on the VPN. But it was good to have that in the interim, just so they had quick access. Yeah. Um, just just one thing back on what you were discussing just a moment ago um, about assigning uh, new laptops or uh, assets to users that are suddenly working remotely instead of allowing them to use their own. Um, we did that, um, but one thing we did notice is users using it from home um, do tend to fall into the habit of assuming it's theirs outside of working hours. You'll find them <laughs> using it for social use. Um, yeah. I, I think we had to throw a few Sophos policies in to block Zoom and certain other applications from being used in the evenings. Yeah, yeah, I guess that depends on on um, uh, on your company policy as well, really. I mean, one of the things uh, I suspect hasn't really been done across the board, um, but, you know, certainly at this point in time, um, updating or, or creating a work from home policy you know, is, is an excellent idea um, and sort of letting the staff know a lot of people, again, that have been thrown into this situation, um, they may not, they may not know. I, I agree. You're mm. given a, you're given a Dell laptop or what have you. Um, uh, and you do tend to, to take ownership of it, you know, once you've peeled the Intel sticker off and uh, cleaned the screen and what have you, you, you tend to think of it as your own after a few weeks. Um, so of course, if the business isn't happy for um, you know, things like out loud Zoom meetings or um, just sort of, you know, home use, then mm. I think articulating that by way of a, a home working policy or a mobile device policy um, that goes out to users. So I think probably from this, we'll see a lot more companies actually get those up to date and, and work out what, you know, what, what their position is. Mm, yeah, it was useful to get us to sit down and think what we do and don't want them to do. Um, and we, we did end up putting a written policy together. So, Yeah, I suppose the, um, the Zoom meetings are all, all good fun and, and no harm done until a sort of bottle of vodka spilt over the keyboard of your company laptop, aren't they? So, mm. but, uh, yeah, I can see the dangers of that with some of the Zoom meetings I've been on the past few weeks. Thank you. Thanks again, Thanks Tom. for that, Tom. Cheers. Uh, we do have a question from Steph. Her hand's been up for quite a while, so apologies for aching, Steph. Um, <laughs> I'll let you unmute and go live. Thank you. Hi, guys. Hope you're all doing okay. Hiya. Hiya. Yeah. Right. Yes, good, thank you. It's kind of a bit of a two-pronged question, really. Um, with the kind of release of government guidance about kind of slowly reopening workplaces, um, I was wondering if you had any thoughts on how people are going to manage going forward with potentially having, you know, maybe half of their team in the office and maybe half the team at home and how that's going to be managed. And I suppose what you kind of see going forward for the future of systems, because obviously you might end up with some companies never returning to their offices and some that do. And there might, again, be a hybrid. So I just thought I'd uh, probe you with see if you've got any ideas and thoughts on that. Yeah, certainly a challenge. Um, Jamie and I actually were speaking to one client um, a week or so ago, and, and well, they've been busy over the past two or three years um, with growth through acquisition. So their office has got probably more cramped than ADM has, I think. Um, and of course, now 
you know, the same challenge we have at ADM, sort of socially distancing when, you know, we've barely got any desk space left for one extra person. Of course, you're um, you're all sat opposite each other and next to each other. So I think there's um, for a lot of people going to be a um, a practical challenge in terms of, of actual space in the building and a number of desks. Um, and then, as you say, you're likely to start to see. Um, challenges around that hybrid model certainly um you know these teams meetings work very well when none of us are in the same room um certainly the moment martin and i join one from the sales office at adm um it's riddled with echo and you know it's a complete nightmare so um yeah one of the things we were talking to this client about was um setting up uh hot desking which i understand is actually is probably going to be against guidelines in any case, um, but they were looking at, you know, sort of spacing out the the workstations um, and then having people hot desk through shifts. But I think um, I, I don't know if it's a complete no no, or if of course you then have to detox that workstation when you leave if you're handing over to someone else. But that's a challenge uh, that they had there. I mean, for the most part, if everyone can work remotely, then everyone should be able to log on without issue from the office. Um, but yeah, I see it as being actually a number of uh, little bite-sized sort of challenges rather than one big infrastructure challenge, really. Yeah. Else has got some input on that. Yeah. So uh, one one thing that uh, struck me is that I did have to go to the office uh, for one particular job because of the internet connectivity we got from ADM. Uh, however, my chair, my two screens, my dock and my laptop have been at home for the last three to four months. So I had to just go in with my laptop. And uh, personally, for me, working from home on just one laptop screen, just I, I can't be anywhere near as efficient. So I've currently got three, my, my laptop screen and my two monitors and my dock here. Uh, I think there might be more and more companies investing in uh, peripherals that will allow them to work more efficiently from home. Uh, it's like I say, if you're going to be sat at a home location, just looking at maybe a 14 inch laptop screen when you can have uh, like remote sessions shared across multiple screens these days. I think uh, maybe there'll be more company policies about enabling staff to take company monitors, etc., home. Uh, yeah, I think uh, I, it's really hard to predict exactly what's going to happen there. I know ADM has spoke about it in our service department ourselves, but as it's, as it's as we, we're quite efficient working in this way, I think my role was one of the most difficult to kind of get used to uh, remote working because I'm a team leader. I'm meant to be overseeing eight to nine uh, members of my team at, at the time. So uh, I think I'm now efficient with that, but I'd say it probably took me a good three weeks to really get used to making sure I called people, had conference calls, checked their workload uh, rather than just a quick verbal conversation, which will be happening and passing when you're making a cup of tea in the office, etc. So uh yeah, it's hard to predict, but like I say, like we, we come up with a strategy for that company that Richard uh, spoke about, uh, and then Boris's next announcement uh, kind of spun that on his head. So uh, I think really we just need to see how the government, when things settle from the government before they start, businesses start really fully really anticipating uh, how they're going to move forward. I think for, for yourself, Steph, apart from the man management point of view, I think obviously everything you're using is... Uh, all the technology you're using should be fine whether you're in the office or outside the office uh, and uh, so, so, something else to mention as well was obviously the guidelines are work at home if you can so uh, the one uh, example of something that's happened recently is if one of our staff members internet connections uh, drops at home uh, so they cannot work from home so uh, do we tell that staff member that they've got to come into the office uh, is that against guidelines it's it's quite a different difficult one uh, as it turned out it was only a brief five ten minute outage but having some sort of company policy about what you do in such a circumstance is something to certainly consider because they can't work from home if their home domestic internet connection is either up not, not up to grade or uh, down at the time and i've seen quite a lot of issues with a certain provider as well where multiple staff members have gone offline at a similar time so uh, that's something to consider obviously yeah there's no wrong or right answer but there's a lot of considerations there 
Yeah, certainly. Thanks, guys. Yeah, it's been quite interesting for us to kind of look into this. And again, we're looking at ordering more peripherals, keyboards, mice, screens to enable staff to have two setups, one at home and one in the office. Should should we eventually kind of decide to work in kind of like a rotor basis so that we can socially distance at the office? So like a team in one week, one team at home and then reversed the following, obviously. So it has been quite an interesting challenge to look at that from a, and I and just from a cleanliness perspective as well. I mean, we know it's so key to kind of keep everyone kind of separate and no contamination. So I think by kind of having almost double the equipment, hopefully we can kind of resolve that issue as well. It kind of kill two birds with one stone. I suppose by doing that stuff as well, if you you might have the outlay of buying extra equipment, but maybe you, you might be able to reduce down how much office space you need. Um, you know, within businesses, especially if you've got multiple offices, you might be able to reduce down how many offices you have. Um, and with with uh, remote working, hopefully staying longer term, it, you know, if we have a repeat of these pandemics over the coming years, it just increases businesses flexibility, allows them to get up, you know, get working much, much quicker in the scenario. So I think it's here, here to stay, definitely. Certainly, and I think that's what we're looking to is having the flexibility to, you know, if, if we get to the point where we can go back to the office safely, that if some things did change um, come the winter, for example, we've got the option to kind of instantly switch off the office, close the office down and, you know, the next day be working from home efficiently. I mean, we're quite lucky. We, you know, we, we can do most of what we do at home. There's very little need for us to be in the office. So, um, yeah, it's just an interesting challenge for, you know, we're quite lucky. We're a simple business. I just think how complicated businesses would uh, would be dealing with this. So I'm grateful we're not too complicated because I have to do it. <laughs> so yeah. I'm pleased it's, uh, it's quite simple. Excellent. Great, Tom's just put on the chat there as well, actually. Thank you, Tom, for, for adding that. Uh, it's just saying a, a good workaround is to actually have um, things like keyboard and mouse allocated to the user. So even if you're sharing, say, a desktop, that you would have your keyboard and mouse. Essentially, you would, um, you know, you could actually present a, a USB hub almost on the corner of the desk. And then when you go, you would take your keyboard and mouse with you. Um, so that all, the, all the touch points, essentially, you're sharing. I can see that working, actually. Yeah, that's certainly what we're looking to do, actually. We're looking to, you know, everyone does have their own mouse and keyboard and, and they will continue to do so. And actually, we're going to have, we're lucky enough that we can do it so that everyone has their own desk. So we won't even have to worry about that in some regards, which is quite a good thing. Again, I, I dread think how other companies who are bigger and got more complex office layouts are going to cope. But I'm sure there'll be a way around it one way or another. Thanks, Tom. I appreciate that. That's good. I certainly see us at ABM and a lot of other businesses. I think when it goes back um, in whatever fashion that is, they're saying they're talking about the schools, each year groups at a time. I certainly think a lot of people will have this staggered. There's no way it seems we're going to go from no one in the office to then having everyone back one day. You know, um, it's interesting the way people sort of talk about oh, when the lockdown's over, we're going to do this and we're going to do that and we'll be down the pub hugging everyone and you know it's, it's definitely going to be phased in that way um, and therefore I think yeah having you know starting now to think about how you facilitate shift changeovers and how you kind of set that rotor up is is definitely the way to the thing to be thinking about next year. I, th I think also as, as Jamie uh, touched on all the technologies lend themselves to the hybrid um, model um so i don't think that's going to be it's, it's more the practical things as we've been discussing with desks and uh, uh social distancing and stuff like that but i think it yeah but as everyone said really i think it's been a very good you know the, the one good thing to come out of it is it, it it is been a test of how you can work remotely and i think um you know so sort of, there's all sort of environmental implications of people not traveling to work so much and stuff like that which um um, I think it's sort of opened eyes, people's eyes a little bit to, to what's possible in terms of remote working. Yeah, I think uh, it'd be interesting to hear your uh, take on this, Steph. But obviously, I think uh, personally, I'm saving around about an hour and a half's worth of time a day uh, by not having to travel to Canterbury from where I live each day, uh, about 45 minutes each round trip. So I'd be I wonder what the staff reaction would be when they're suddenly they've got to maybe get up an hour earlier and get home an hour later etc it's just obviously we had our, our jobs based on the location that we're setting uh when, when you got the jobs i guess but uh there's gonna be maybe three four five months maybe more of working from your home location where quite a lot of bent there are quite a lot of uh well-being and 
kind of lifestyle benefits to this way. Uh, so uh, have you had any conversations uh, around that at all, Steph? Or? Yeah, certainly have done, Jamie. It's been quite interesting, actually. You know, at a director level, we've had the conversation about whether, you know, we're going to get more requests for flexible working in the future. You know, whether the staff are going to want to maybe do, you know, one day a week at home every week or, or things like that. Um, and also just we've had a couple like the guys have had one to one conversations with all the team and actually some of them are there's a group of them that are happy working from home and there's a group of them as we all probably know that want to be back in the office because they have other interruptions in their home lives and um, it's managing that isn't it it's managing that that kind of everybody's kind of needs and making sure that their well-being especially you know as it's mental health awareness week just making sure everybody's um okay and can be getting on with what they need to so i think yeah definitely we've, we've kind of put a plan together where we can see some people still working at home some people coming in maybe one or two days a week in the future some of us in there all the time to oversee things it, it's just really going to have to be flexible and uh yeah it's great that we've got it that enables us to kind of act that flexibly you know like you say pick up your laptop and go um for me in terms of traveling on with you jamie i am um, i'm saving a fortune on petrol at the moment and it, which is interesting considering it's only 99p a litre where i am at the moment so it's almost, <laughs> yeah, yeah. almost a killer that i'm not using it because i'll be saving you know we'll be saving money <laughs> doing it that way I'll, I'll no, 20, really yeah, 20 pound 20 pounds worth of petrol in my tank during this whole pandemic yes. that's all it's i've done crazy, isn't it? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, did, I did travel the other day it popped up on the dashboard and you know ding petrol light and uh it said on the range 41 miles. I thought, 41 miles, that's going to last me six weeks. <laughs> yeah, I'm driving around the corner to Tesco's and back once a week. So, uh, yeah, there's definitely benefits to it, isn't there, in that way? certainly are and it's been very interesting for us as you know we're only a small company as you guys will know there's only very bit for your other attendees there's only 15 of us so it's been quite an interesting um switch from from office to home but one that seems to have happened quite easily and gratefully grateful for teams really for, for enabling that to be facilitated and you know we were able to keep in touch easily and uh have those conversations you know we're having a quiz night this week and all those things it's it's so good to still be able to do that Thanks very much for that, Steph. Um, we have had Tom as well chime in and say that they found uh, that their tech and media team were more than happy to stay from home, um, while their social users, i.e. Uh, help desk and admin, were pushing to go back in. Um, and this really helps as they can just social distance those staffs using the seats of the IT and media staff. He says, though, it'd still need to go in as the technician to manage the IT side of the switch. <laughs> And we also have a uh, question that's come through from David Foley, so I'll let you uh, unmute, Dave. So, thanks very much. Uh, yes, it is. Uh, we've got some data back from schools and colleges who are finding this very challenging, and uh, particularly for the disadvantaged children, the children in care, uh, and those who get free school meals, because they're at home often with either no IT facilities or poorly monitored IT facilities. And uh, I was talking to some of the universities and colleges yesterday and they say they do actually have some funds to, to buy these laptops, but that they can't find them. There's something called the Kent Pledge, which KCC produces, which says every child in care uh, more than six months is entitled to, to, to a laptop, but they're finding it difficult to find. I just wondered, um, I'm not asking you now to say where to find 100 laptops, but is there someone at ADM who we could direct them to who could perhaps give them some advice? Oh, you dropped out right towards the end for me there, David. Hopefully you can hear me okay. I can hear you, yes. Can you hear me? Yeah, so it's just at the very end you froze, that's all. All right. Uh, uh, is there somebody at ADM we can direct them to so you can uh, assist them in uh, how they can get, say, 100 laptops at reasonably short notice and uh, give them some advice as to what's appropriate for uh, particularly their disadvantaged students? They can no doubt distribute them and so on. And, and I believe the funds are available. They just need uh, s some advice. Yeah, we can certainly happy to, to have a chat. Um, laptops were, you know, along with loo rolls, went into restraint quite early on in the um, in the pandemic. Um, things like the headsets as well, actually, uh, that we use with teams. We found these things are just coming back in, but, you know, that's a, a 30, 40 quid wired headset. You couldn't buy them 
for love nor money. Um, that is easing. Um, I suppose it didn't help a lot of things do come in from China, who obviously had issues quite early on. Um, but yeah, absolutely. If you wanted to point them um, towards ADM, a colleague of mine, Christian, actually, uh, who works with me, um, looked at a lot of laptops and things for us um, and could possibly help out with that. Some of them that will. That name, Richard, is Christian, you say? Christian, yeah. But I'll send you, um, I'll follow up, David, and send you both my details and his. Um, and we can certainly give you some advice. Sometimes the consumer grade laptops um, aren't something we necessarily source because if no. they're for kids in, in care, they may want consumer grade, in which case we could signpost you hopefully somewhere um, or certainly help you out with it. But yeah, we, we can try. It has been difficult, but we managed to secure largely enough laptops that, for the, the requirements we had in our client base when it all hit. So. I know you've had a lot of experience with education going back, you know, 20 odd years. ADM's worked a lot with uh, trainers and professional training organisations. So I'd be more than happy to pass those pass those on to you. Thanks very much. Thank you. Jamie, did you want to cover off some of the Teams features? Well, I'm not sure if you'd elected John for that, but... Um... Uh, uh, no, yeah, I can go through it really. Uh, yeah, so uh, some of you may know that uh, for a while now, uh, Microsoft have been promising a few new features to come to Teams. Uh, three of those features uh, started appearing this week. So uh, one limitation, which especially when compared to Zoom, was how many concurrent like video streams you could have, how many webcams you could see at any one time. Uh, I think Monday was the first uh, video call I shared on Teams where suddenly uh, I had eight concurrent videos, uh, the maximum being nine. So uh, if you've not got that already, if you've not seen that already, you might have seen it during this meeting. Uh, that is being rolled out. We can't really control when you're going to get that update yourselves, but it's um, it's in Microsoft's interest to push it out. So it is live and I'd expect within the next week or so, everyone's Teams clients to have updated to the version that allows for that. Uh, another feature, uh, if you are a Teams user, uh, which I've been wanting for quite a long time, is the pop-out chat functionality. So uh, during this conversation, as I mentioned earlier, I've got three screens here. So I've got my laptop screen with this video uh, conference on. And then uh, I've been able to speak to some colleagues on another screen because I popped out the chat to there rather than having to kind of navigate one screen uh, in my Teams app and kind of not be able to see the, the chat going on while I'm watching the video, etc. So uh, that's another one that's live. Uh, if you do want to do that, there's a little, uh, if you go over the chat icon, uh, when you're talking to someone, uh, there is a little button. Uh, it's really hard to describe. It uh, just looks like a maximized screen kind of button. Uh, and it says pop out chat. If you click that, you can go uh, kind of full screen or half screen, whatever you like, really, and drag it off to a suitable place on your desktop. Uh, and the final one, a few of you have used today, actually, so I think it's quite a obvious one, really, is the hands up feature. Uh, I think this is now the fourth Q&A session we've done, and previously we was getting people to write, write the word me in the, the meeting chat, and then people would then uh, be able to ask their questions. So now the hands up feature basically makes that a bit more noticeable. Uh, and uh, other platforms have been doing such a uh, had such a feature for some time. It's it's probably worth um, just noting if you haven't got some of these features, they are they are being rolled out sort of tenant by tenant, um, and uh, and sometimes they do require the um, Teams client to be restarted for it to actually take effect. For example, I've got the the hands up and the um, uh, the multiple video streams, but I don't have the pop out chat option. I probably need to restart my client for that to be picked up. So, um, but as Jamie said, these things are sort of being rolled out all the time, and it's the way Microsoft are um, developing uh, Teams at the moment. They're, they're bringing this functionality in continuously. Um, yeah, Matt's just mentioning also the other the big changes um, with the backgrounds. Obviously, uh, you probably noticed me and Jamie have got the blurred background that's been around for quite a while, but you can now set um, uh, custom backgrounds. I'm sure somebody will probably uh, change themselves to sitting in front of a beach or something in a minute. Uh, and you also do have the option to upload custom images. So we've 
we've we've produced a background with uh, like an ADM logo in the background, which um, uh, is quite useful. And the other thing that they are bringing out is the ability to control that, because um, obviously in, in certain environments we might have potentially um, inappropriate backgrounds. So. Um, from an admin point of view, um, there is now some measure of control as to what backgrounds people can set uh, on a sort of company-wide and per-user basis. So James on a nice beach there. Yeah, it's probably like that outdoors today. I've not actually been out of the house <laughs> yet. Because <laughs> I said I've booked this afternoon off, so I plan on changing my background potentially to something like that, but uh, in real life later on. So. Must have a virtual holiday, Richard, wouldn't it? That's right, yeah. <laughs> so if you missed John's advice, sorry, on the, um, if you haven't got these features, I think John's uh, predictable technical advice there, if I'm not mistaken, was to turn it off and then turn it back on again. So um, <laughs> what wise words coming from our, our lead technician. <laughs> yeah, you're sharing our secrets here, Richard. <laughs> Brilliant. Thanks, guys. Um, I think we'll probably be about set to wrap up. Um, just a quick one as well, in case anyone has, has any more questions during this, feel free to raise your hand. Um, we do have a couple of events coming up. Uh, let me just share my screen here. So on our ADM Computing Events page, we have our Microsoft OneNote webinar on the 10th of June. That will be at 10.30. Uh, more information on that coming soon. That will be a deeper dive into OneNote and the features that's included. And then we have our Microsoft 365 in the Modern Workplace webinar session as well. Um, that will be from 1 to 2 p.m. on the 15th of June. And that will be a much deeper dive into Teams, Power BI, SharePoint and OneNote as well. Um, so if any of you are interested in that, you can feel free to either go on our website, admcomputing.co.uk slash events, or you can reach out to me on 01227 473 501 or email me at isaac at adm hyphen computing.co.uk to register and I'll pop all these details down in the chat. And I'll go back to you, Richard, to wrap up. Thanks, Isaac. And thank you to everyone for joining and, and to those that have come on and asked questions and, and um, generally sort of been in the session. Um, so yeah, do keep your your eyes on the dates for our events. Hopefully, you'll receive those invites, and um, we'll look forward to seeing you all again soon. Thanks uh, th very much, Richard. Just the ticket. Thanks very much. Everybody Thank seems you. to be doing quizzes at the moment. I got caught the other day. The question was which month has twenty eight days. I put February, and the correct answer is, of course, all of them. So <laughs> <laughs> don't get caught like I was. <laughs> I'm for that as well. Thank you very much for your time. Thanks very much. Bye for now. Thanks, bye guys. Bye.